Okay, so I was in ninth grade at McKenzie Junior High School in Lubbock, Texas, when um, we had career aptitude test day. Okay, now career aptitude test day, I didn't even know what it was. I had never really thought about what I wanted to do for a living. But they made us take this test so that we could figure out where our aptitude lie, lied, laid, mine was in grammar, um, <laughs> where, where we had our aptitude so that we could figure out where we might want to uh, 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 look for a career and, and that might influence what we wanted to take as far as classes in high school, etc. So I took the test, uh, we all had to, and I did my very, very best. And I got kind of excited thinking about it. And sure enough, the results came in, and I had three careers that I seemed especially prepared for. One was to be a lawyer. The second was to be a preacher. And the third was to be a politician. <laughs> <laughs> Debbie Riddle. <laughs> Those were my three aptitudes, okay? Now, there were other things way far down, but there, those three were in a cut by themselves. And I thought, well, they all sound pretty cool. Uh, you watch lawyers on TV, and lawyers, I thought, argued for a living. I love to argue. Um, in, in middle school, when I left middle school, we had the uh, 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 last will and testament where the, the, the graduating class wrote for each person what they were leaving behind. And unknown to me, the people who wrote it for me said, Mark Lanier leaves his natural argumentative ability to. Bah, bah, bah. I mean, I've always liked to argue. So I thought that would be a tremendous job. As for preaching, I loved the Lord. I loved Bible study. I admired our preacher. I thought, wouldn't that be an incredible uh, opportunity in life to do that? Politicians, uh, uh, hey, go Richard Nixon at the time. Uh, <laughs> my things have changed. And uh, uh, no, I, was, I thought politicians, that sounded like a really cool way to go too. So I went into high school and I tried to take everything I could to facilitate this aptitude. So I took debate every year. I took uh, e extemporaneous speaking. We actually had a different class for that than for debate. I took that. I took um, uh, Latin for three years. I had our, our college intern who was working with the high school students at our church who was taking first year, or actually advanced Greek. I had him start tutoring me in New Testament Greek. And, and I just loved it. I got out. I went to college. And it and turns out you can't get a degree for politics. They just say you have to be friendly so I thought, well, I'll try to be friendly, and that'll cover the politics end, and then, and, and believe in something and stand for what you believe in, in fairness to the nice, wonderful politicians we have in our group here. Um, but they're also very friendly. Um, so you got to be friendly to be a politician, to be a preacher. I thought, well, I could just major in preaching, but I liked so, okay, excuse me. This plant keeps me from seeing you guys very well, and it's been bothering me for weeks. Now, so, <laughs> sorry, I just, I just need, need that. So, um, so I go to college, I think, well, I, I need to get a, a college degree to go to law school, but I also need a seminary degree type thing to preach, so I go to a school that's got both combined into one, and I get the degree instead of in preaching, I get it in biblical languages, because I like the Bible study aspect, and I was thinking I could also maybe be like a a language professor at a, at a seminary or at a school. So I, I went that route. And then I, gradu I was set to graduate. I was almost graduating from college, and I had to decide, what am I going to do? Do I want to go preach? I'd taken a minor in economics, figuring that that might help me somewhere down the road, too. That seemed a little more law school prep-ish. And I thought, do I want to preach? Uh, I did have a chance to go into business, or do I want to uh, uh, go to law school? So I met with our preacher. And the preacher sat down with me, and he gave me some great advice. He said, Lanier, <clears throat> at your age and with a couple of other factors that I won't detail right now, he said, what you really ought to do is you ought to go to law school. He said, but just make a commitment that you're going to teach Sunday school. 
He said, and in the process, as long as you're teaching Sunday school, you get to do all of the fun stuff of preaching without doing all the headache stuff. There's no budget. There's no, uh, you know, dealing with uh, uh, staff and all of that kind of mess. He says, you get to do exactly what you feel called and, and what you want to do, but you get to make a living and do it because you're choosing to and not because you have to, to support your family. And I said, well, that sounds really good. And so I did that, but my whole goal in practicing law was just to make sure we made enough money so I could do this. And, and, and it took a while to, to really get into the groove of practicing law to where I felt like I'd come into my own. And it took a while to get the groove into teaching Sunday school, even though I've done it for, I guess at this point, almost uh, 35 years, but to come into where I feel comfortable. And I wake up each day and I'm excited to go to work, and I'm excited to have my family, and I'm excited to have this time and to get to prepare for, for this lesson each week. I'm incredibly honored that y'all would give this much time to something that, that God's been, been working through in my mind and in my heart. And so uh, the neat part of it is it's the way God just puts a whole thing together. Little did... Now, uh, true, the politician thing's never happened, it probably never would happen, but I get to lobby with the politicians right here, which is almost the same thing as I talk to them every Sunday, right, Stan, politician. Uh, so, so here we go, and I just, I'm going to date myself here, and those of you who are younger than 50 may not appreciate this unless you watch really old TV, and you'll have to excuse me putting a cigar guy up on a Baptist church screen, but here it is. <laughs> What's it say? Well, it says, I love it when a plan comes together. I love it when a plan comes together. That was his famous line in the A-Team, if you missed that. Sorry. Uh, I was doing that last night on very little sleep. So, uh, it's, at the time, it seemed really good. Um... <laughs> I just love it when a plan comes together. When all of these little individual pieces that have been sewn all grow up and, and, and it's just exactly what clearly the hand of God had set out. I love it when a plan comes together. And this we see this with Paul this week. So I want to look at Paul. We talked a little bit last week and the weeks before, make sure we're all on the same page. If we're looking at about 33 AD as a touchstone time-wise, we know Paul was born in a Greek climate, in a Greek culture, in Tarsus, which produced Greek scholars as their principal export, were Greek educators, teachers. We know that Paul, both from his history there, his Roman citizenship, his citizenship of the city of Tarsus on top of that, from Paul's language, the Greek metaphors that he used, how he would talk about the Greek races, how he would talk about things that, that dealt with Greek economics, Greek culture, Greek society. Paul grew up very, very Greek, and yet we know he left Tarsus and went with some family to Jerusalem for a formal training as a Jewish rabbi. Paul was trained to be a rabbi. He studied under the feet of Gamaliel, who was the most prominent, famous, well-regarded rabbi of his day. We still today have writings and sayings, I should say, not writings, but sayings of Gamaliel that have been preserved by the Jews because he was so well-regarded and so wise and so famous. So we've got that, Paul Greek, Paul Jew. Then in 33 AD or thereabout, C for about, circa in the Latin, around, around 33 AD, Paul is on the road to Damascus. He converts, stays in Damascus till about 35. And I say convert, that's not a comfortable word for me for what Paul did. Paul was already a believer in God, 
Paul just did not know that Jesus was Messiah. And Paul accepted Jesus as his Lord and as his Savior. But it was a fulfillment of the, the, the faith he already had as a Jew. It wasn't a new religion. Okay, So Paul, for a couple of years, is in Damascus, a year or two, goes back to Jerusalem briefly, has a real tough time there in Jerusalem around 35 A.D., at first not accepted, then Barnabas, the son of encouragement, real name Joseph. Barnabas sort of gets Paul into the swing with the apostles. But things aren't really g and hawing well in Jerusalem. Um, that's an expression that no one is going to get unless you g and haw, which is how you... Well, in Alaska they'll get it because it's how you tell a sled dog to go left or right pulling a sled. But it can also be used for a mule in Texas. We don't have a lot of sled dogs. But anyway, uh, where was I? Uh, so, yes. So things weren't going smoothingly, smoothly in Jerusalem. And Paul is sent home in a sense. Paul is sent back to Tarsus. Paul goes back to Tarsus. And Paul stays in Tarsus, scholars differ on this, but somewhere between seven, eight, nine years. And Paul is in Tarsus for that period of time. And if we look at it, it's in 44 AD that Paul gets put back into the game. But for that nine-year stretch, let's stretch it out a little bit. For that nine-year stretch... You've got quite a length of time for Paul to be on the bench. Paul is not um, uh, uh, playing. He's not even, you, you can't read anything about him in the book of Acts. Here's this man that God's done these miraculous things in his life. He's called him on the road to Damascus. He's appeared to him. He said, you're going to preach to the Gentiles. He said, you're going to, you're going to deliver my message. And he got to for a while in Damascus. And he got to for a smidgen of time in Jerusalem. But here with all of his training, with all of his uniqueness... He gets shipped out to Tarsus and he goes home and just kind of lives there for seven, eight, nine years. It's a long time to be on the bench. But then Barnabas is preaching and working up at the church in Antioch and decides this is the mission field where Paul needs to be. And Barnabas goes and gets Paul from Tarsus and brings him back. And for the next year or so, with the church just flourishing in Tarsus. Paul and Barnabas are there teaching. Now, this is where I want to pause for a moment because I want us to look at a passage out of Acts. I want us to look at Acts 13, verse 1. This is a great, great passage. And this is the kind of stuff that if I don't get to tell you about it, then I, I feel like we miss out. You may already know it. But if you don't, hey, this is the kind of freebie that you get when you come to CFBC on a Sunday morning. I mean, this is, you don't get this just anywhere. You ready? Now, so here we are. Barnabas and uh, Saul, let's, let's put it into context, have just come back to, the, they'd been in Antioch. They ran down to Jerusalem with some famine relief. They went back up to Antioch. Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, that bringing the famine relief, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. John Mark went with him. That's the Mark who wrote our second gospel. Now there were in the church in Antioch, at Antioch, prophets and teachers. Barnabas, whom we know about, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Minean, a member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now that's what I want to pause on for a moment. A member of the court. You see that? A member of the court. It's a Greek word. The Greek word is, well, we can write it here. We've got a Bible we can write on. The Greek word is syntrophos. 
uh, soon, how would you spell soon trophos? T R O P O S. Soon trophos. So that uh, a soon trophos is a very special kind of friend. It it relates to in a, in a king's house when a prince is being brought up. They didn't want the prince just out there running around with the common folk. But they also knew the prince needed friends. What young growing boy doesn't want to have some friends? So there were hand-selected children who got to be brought up at court with the young prince. And these were his playmates. These were his friends. These were the ones who taught him socially as they learned themselves socially and they reacted. Those were the soon trophos, says. <laughs> so how do you translate that with a word or a phrase? It's hard to do. Different translations do it differently. The ESV says, my Nian was a member of the court whoops, of Herod the Tetrarch a member of the court. In other words, he was the young fella who was there as part of uh, the rearing of Herod the Tetrarch way back when Herod was a little boy. Now Herod, as I've told you before, there are a lot of Herods in the New Testament and even more outside the New Testament because it was a prominent family with a prominent family name, and kind of like George Foreman, they just kept naming every kid born into the family Herod. So, Herod the Tetrarch, Luke is always really good for us in the New Testament at specifying which Herod he's talking about. Herod the Tetrarch is the one that Luke's already told us about in his gospel, because Herod the Tetrarch was the Herod that had John the Baptist beheaded. He was the Herod, uh, uh, the Tetrarch, the ruler, the Herod ruler over Galilee. So when Jesus is arrested before the, the crucifixion, they say, Pilate says, hey, he's from Galilee, send him to Herod. That's Herod's business. And it's Herod before whom Jesus is brought, and Herod writes him off and sends him on his way to be executed. So you've got Luke putting this little nugget in there. Just letting people know, boom, here are two boys that grew up in the same place, in the same household, playing together as good friends, eating the same food, being taught by the same teachers, best buds. One of them chooses to go in life in a way that leads to the beheading of John the Baptist and leads to the crucifixion of Jesus. The other becomes a believer in Jesus, and a relationship with Almighty God changes his world and changes his life, and he's a teacher in the church, the fastest growing church at the time, probably in the world. And if we just read past that, and we don't pause for a moment, and think about the implications that it has for every one of us, Two boys, same household. One chooses to go one direction, one chooses to go the other. And we're fooling ourselves if we don't understand that the roads we choose lead to destinations that are diametrically apart. And oh for the wisdom to know the destination you want so that you choose the road to get there. Sorry. Had to throw that in. So... Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Um, so what we've got now is we've got uh, 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 Paul, Barnabas. We've got them there in Antioch. They're preaching. They stay there for a couple of years. And they're at a worship service. And this is the passage that Luke gives us. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, probably was not donut day that day at church. 
while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, quote, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now, Luke wants us to, to, to know without question the mission effort of the church is the mission effort of God. It's the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit says, set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Again, also, this shows even in the early church an understanding the Holy Spirit is not an it, the Holy Spirit's a person, God, set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I've called them. So the church does so. Paul, still being called Saul, I should add, Barnabas, and Luke. I mean, John Mark, excuse me. Though Luke, scholars believe Luke is from Antioch as well, but we'll get to that another day. So we have Barnabas and Saul and they take John Mark with them, and they commence on a mission trip. Now, they don't go away until the church has fasted again, laid hands on them, prayed for them, and then off they go to do this work that the Holy Spirit has called them to do. If we throw the map up, we can add some details. Some of y'all are map people. So let's put it up there. We can put Antioch. Now, again, Antiochus was a big name back then. It was a big family name. You had Antiochus I, Antiochus II, Antiochus the cousin, Antiochus the uncle. So all of these Antiochuses would take towns and cities that they had under their realm. And do you know what they'd do? They would rename them after themselves. Antioch is named after Antiochus. And there's like 50 gajillion towns called Antioch back then. It's just like, it's Smithville, okay? Antioch. So they're in Antioch. They go south a little bit. Antioch's on the Orange's River. They go south a little bit, and they pick up a boat that has a 130-mile journey over to the island of Cyprus, now, the island of Cyprus, they put in at Salamis, which is the closest town, port town, to where they sailed from. Now, Salamis, Cyprus as an island, that's the island that Barnabas and John Mark were from. That's where their families were from. So for Barnabas and John Mark, this is kind of going home. But they're going home with a purpose. It's not go home for vacation, it's go home to work. It's go home to work for the Holy Spirit and the, the work the Holy Spirit has called them to. And so off they go. You can go to the island today. And if you go today, you can see the road that comes from the port, where the port was at the time, into Salamis. One road is all there was. You can actually go and walk on the road knowing you're walking on the road that Paul, Barnabas, and Mark walked on when they landed. Luke tells us they went into Salamis, they preached at the synagogues there, and then after at the synagogues there, so, oh, yeah, put them on the road. Look, hold on, we can do that again. Boom. Ooh. So they get to the road, and, and uh, uh, from there, they go across the island, we don't know which way. There was a northern route and a southern route, so I just drew it across the middle because there were two different roads. But they go across the island to Paphos, which is a port town on the other side. And in Paphos, we have a good bit of dialogue, and three important things happen that I want to make sure we talk about. So uh, uh, let's look at these things of note. The story is in Acts 13, 6 through 12, and uh, we'll look at the story together. We can start it in the flow of things uh, with verse 4. Um, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, that's the port city, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They had John to assist them. That's John Mark that uh, Luke's been talking about just in the earlier verses. 
When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, which is on the opposite side, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. Interesting name. Means son of Jesus. But this was no son of Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, or Sergius Paulus, as they would have said, a man of intelligence, smart fella, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. So now you've got a Roman proconsul. He's the ruler of the island. It's not a small island. It's a pretty big island. And as the ruler of the island... He's a man of intelligence. He wants to hear from Paul and Barnabas. Actually, uh, from Barnabas and Saul. See, I need to be more clear. He summons Barnabas and Saul. Note that. You got it? You'll be quizzed on this in a minute. But Elemus the magician, for that's the meaning of his name, the name Elemus, not Bar Jesus, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, also in the sense of, also in addition to Saul, but also in the sense of, in addition to Sergio Paulus. Paul was the name of the proconsul. So Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, not son of Jesus, not bar Jesus, but son of the devil. You enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord's upon you. You'll be blind. You'll be unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him. He went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. And the proconsul, smart fella, believed when he saw what had occurred. For he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now, I want us to notice three things here. I want us to notice, first of all, this is where... Luke quits calling Paul Saul and starts calling him Paul from here on out. Three exceptions, but those exceptions are when Paul is telling a story about his conversion where Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So, okay, so, so in, the main, in Luke's narrative, from here on out, Paul is Paul, which tells us this is a real turning point in the narrative. And we're going to pick up this turning point in more ways than one. The second way it's a turning point is this is the first time we see Paul doing a miracle. Paul's always been the preacher. Paul has not been the apostle who's been out there like Peter, uh, been out there like John, healing the lame, raising the dead. It's the first time we see Paul not just saying the word, but seeing the Holy Spirit working through Paul to effectuate his mission. This again is not Paul's mission. This is the Holy Spirit's mission. And that's why Paul, listen, I want to tell you something. Elimas bar Jesus, the magician, son of Jesus, who's really the son of the devil, tries to stand in the way of God and the Holy Spirit and what Paul and Barnabas are about. And that's not happening. It was the very belligerent, antagonistic actions of Elimus bar Jesus that brought about the work of the Holy Spirit that pushed the proconsul over into faith. Because as Paul declared blindness upon him, and that miracle happened, an intelligent proconsul says, okay, <laughs> something's going on here. <laughs> this is for real. And you can, and, and, and people can try to thwart the mission of God. 
But when the story is over, they're going to see that their efforts to thwart the mission of God only furthered the mission of God. That's the majesty of God's sovereign nature. I love this story. Sorry, I get carried away. Now, here's the third reason. Let's go back to the Elmo for a moment. Barnabas and Saul. Whoops, I underlined that for you. Remember? And this is, this is consistent. Set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul. Look at the end of chapter 12. And Barnabas and Saul returned home. From here on out, it's flipped. It'll be Paul and Barnabas. And Paul takes the leadership role. There's one exception that's an exception for a very good reason that I'll show you about. It was a misperception by the people who associated Paul with Hermes and, and Barnabas with Zeus. That's because they thought they were the Greek gods with these miracles happening. And Zeus, as a Greek god, was so high and mighty he wouldn't deal with humans. He'd have a mouthpiece like Hermes talk for him. So they assumed Paul would be Hermes because he's the talker. And Barnabas was not. But this is a real corner that's being turned here. This is a real, this is, I love it when a plan comes together. Because now Paul is dealing with a Roman, Greco-Roman proconsul and a Jewish magician, antagonizer of the faith, and is able to bring to, to completion this finished work of the Holy Spirit in converting Sergius Paulus. It's a great story. All right, back to the map. We've got to keep going. So, what happens? Those three are in Paphos. This is a, a picture of Paphos today. It's a sea town. And from Paphos, they set sail and they go back to what we would call mainland Turkey. They go to Perga. Perga is uh, uh, just in, inland right there. Mainland Turkey. You can go there today. You can see the Roman ruins. It's a coastal town. Now, they're in Perga. We don't know the details of it, except we know that from there a decision is made to go. If you look at this picture of Perga, I hope you can see it and, and, and have a chance to see it. There are mountains behind it. Perga is the coastal plain, but the mountains are behind it. Paul makes a decision that they need to go into the mountains. John Mark, he doesn't want to go. So he quits. He just quits. He says, I'm going back home. I'm going to Jerusalem. See ya. And so with him gone, Lou, uh, Barnabas... And Paul, although now it's Paul and Barnabas, I guess we should switch them. They head on up into the mountains. Now, why? Why do they decide, why does Paul decide they're going into the mountains? Luke doesn't tell us. But we do get a hint from Paul. See, the mountains where they're going are the mountains of an area that is called a region, and I should have put it on the map, so instead you get to see how poorly I write, I mean draw maps. All right, so if you're thinking of the Mediterranean world, it's kind of like this. you got Greece that kind of comes out, and it's got the little stuff like that, and then you got the boot of Italy. Okay, well that's not really good. But you get the idea, okay? Okay, that's really bad. Um, but, uh, so here's your island of uh, Cyprus. Um, okay, quit laughing. This is, the people in Greece would be real happy with this. It made their country a lot bigger than it is. Uh, that could be why they're having all those economic problems now. So what happens to them is this. This region, not the coastal region of Pisidia where they are, but that mountainous range where they're going, it was settled, if you go back 
there were Gauls up in Germany, modern Germany, whoops, modern Germany, uh, France, down into France, and a little bit of the little goofy countries all around there. There were Gauls that had fought their way down into Turkey two, three hundred years earlier. And the Gauls had really settled in this region, but they'd been interbreeding with the Greeks. So they were Gallo-Grecians. Or Galatians, as we would call them. This is the region of Gallo-Grecian settlement. Galatia is what they called it then. The letter to the Galatian churches in our New Testament is a letter that Paul would write to these churches that he's going to right now. That's probably the first letter Paul wrote that we have in the New Testament. So if we go back to the, oh, we're already, you're ahead of me, on the PowerPoint. So they go inland and they go up to this area. Let's see, boom. Okay, my remote control may have just died on us. This could be bad. Boom. Hello? There. Um, so they go into this region, and here's what they do. They go north into the mountain range of Pisidian Antioch. It's Antioch in Pisidia. I told you there are lots of Antiochs around there. So this is not Syrian Antioch, where we were at the start. This is Pisidian Antioch. And they go there, and, and you ask why, and I got two possible reasons. Let's look at Galatians 4.13, which is a letter Paul wrote just a few years later. And he wrote it to these churches where they went. And in the process of writing that Galatian letter, Paul said the following. Uh, if we can go to the Elmo, please. Thank you. Paul says... You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. So Paul was sick. And because he's sick, he's thinking that fresh mountain air might be just the, the thing that he needs. So it's through an illness that Paul heads up to Galatia. And Paul takes the gospel with him and changes the focus on the mission trip. John Mark doesn't want to go. He says, hey, this wasn't the plan. Now, scholars uh, try to guess what was sick, what was wrong with Paul. Uh, Ramsey, William Ramsey, said he thinks that it was malaria. So Paul's going to get away from the coastal region where malaria is bad. But Paul had a serious bodily ailment that would, frankly, cause most of us to quit. Say, uh, I'm going home. <laughs> i got to get well. I'll hit the mission field again as soon as I'm well. Time out. Got to go to the doctor. Paul's not that far from Tarsus. He could have gone to Tarsus in a heartbeat. But instead, Paul's just kind of like, no. I'll get better if I get some mountain air. Come on, let's go there. We're on the work of the Holy Spirit. Maybe even this sickness is something God gave me to cause us to go that way. Who knows? But we're going. And Paul doesn't quit. He keeps going. They go up to Pisidian Antioch. And when they're there... Now, there's another reason that may have been a place to go. And I've put up here Sergius Paulus. Remember who he was? That was the proconsul that found the, the faith when Paul and, and uh, Barnabas were on Paphos. Sergius Paulus, it turns out, archaeology has shown us, if you go, they were digging in the area of uh, Pisidian Antioch. And there they found this massive stone. It's in a museum there now. It's like the Yak Museum or something. But there's this massive stone that talks about the family of Sergius Paulus. And you can still make out, if you look at the very middle of the top, the P-A, that is a U, it just looks like a V. But the Latin's because when you're carving in stone, 
with a hammer and a chisel, try to make a real U. It's just like not really happening. But a V piece of cake, which by the way, just for grins, another freebie at this church, is why we call a double V a double U in our alphabet. Same thing. All right, so that's P A U L L I. That may be the start of another Sergius there, S E R. We've got another Sergius underneath it, S E R G. You can make out the G. This was a big family name. They had substantial property holdings, they were a prominent family. And you can see, first of all, the proconsul wouldn't have just sent Paul and Barnabas and John Mark without someone to go with them. He's excited. He's got a brand new faith. They go out there and they go with him. And uh, uh, thank you. And so they go out there and they go with him. And it's got to be an exciting time for them. So they sent, you know, Sergius Paulus says, hey, if you get a chance, go see my family. Tell them about the Lord, please. And he sends someone with them to help them. And so Paul says, I need some mountain air. I need some mountain. Hey, let's go to Pisidian Antioch. We'll go see Sergius Paulus's folks. He wanted us to go anyway. And so off they go. When they're there, they go to the synagogue. And at the synagogue, they have their first meeting. Now, I want to pause for a moment. And I want to talk about synagogues. And what we need to do is time travel. So we're going to vote on how we time travel for a minute. We're going to see if this works. It may not work. How many of you saw the old TV show, The Time Tunnel? Raise your hand. All right. How many of you have watched Doctor Who? Raise your hand. Do we have more Whovians than The Time Tunnel? Yes, the TARDIS. Okay, then we will take the TARDIS back in time. Okay, you've just gone back in time in a TARDIS. Now we're at a first century synagogue. Um, This is what happens when I do my PowerPoint the night before instead of the morning of. There's a reason I should not be doing that. I was really proud of this last night. Um, If you had voted for the time tunnel, I would have been in serious trouble, though, because I did not have that ready to go. Um, If we were to go back in time to a synagogue service, what would it be like? Well, we have real good ideas. We can read lots about those first century synagogues. First of all, they were generally positioned near some river or stream or a body of water because there was a lot of need for water for purification ceremonies. Second of all, when we walked in the door, there would be seats made out of wood and they, because they'd have to be able to move them. But the seating would be such where the richer, more established, older, generally, well-to-do, Lord High Muckety Mucks sat in the seats closest to the front. The riffraff sat in the back. And everybody else sort of sat in the middle. But you knew the closer you got to the front, the more dignity you had because those were seats of respect. So they had very clear seating. Now also there would be a tibo, a, a, a cabinet, a tibo, I'm sorry, a cabinet that was um, supposed to be reminiscent of the Ark of the Covenant in a way, but it would hold the scrolls. The scrolls of the the of the Old Testament. They'd be wrapped in linen. There would also be a bima or a a pulpit or a podium, a dais up at the front. And it would be on the bima that the service would be conducted. Now you had a ruler of the synagogue. Synagogue is actually a Greek word. You had a ruler of the synagogue, what uh, Luke calls the archisynagogue, But you have the ruler, and he's not a ruler in the sense of the boss. He's the ruler in the sense of he's responsible for making sure they've got someone who can lead the prayers, 
someone who can read the scripture, someone who can say something about the scripture. He's just sort of conducting, making sure the service is going right each week. You've also got an attendant. The attendant's in charge of taking care of the scrolls, removing them, putting them back. You've got all of this. And then the service itself is not so much a worship service the way we do it. It was built around three different things. There would be a reading. The reading would be from the law, and that would be a lengthier reading, and then from the prophets. After the reading, there would be a sermon, and then there would be a prayer to which the congregation would say, Amen. Now, this is what happens with Paul. Let's look at the story in Acts 13, 14. And uh, you can see that it takes place just the way it should. Um, Acts 13, started with verse 13. Now, Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos. They came to Perga. John left them, returned to Jerusalem. They went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue. They sat down. They took their seats. We don't know which seats they sat in. But they probably visited with people. And don't you know, in this little mountain town of Pisidian Antioch, they must have been a little stunned to have a man come in who's rabbinically trained in Jerusalem at the temple by the leading rabbi of their day. It's basically the functional equivalent of us thinking of someone coming into our midst who has the highest possible education and training level we could conceive of. After the reading from the law and the prophets, that's what's done first, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them. Now the rulers of the synagogue, Archisinogoge, they're the ones in charge of finding people. They don't have permanent preachers. They don't have permanent readers. The rulers of the synagogue are the ones in charge of parceling out to different people the chores for the service. Sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. Would you like to be our guest preacher today? And Paul's into it. Paul says, as a matter of fact, I do have something to say. And he starts with the Old Testament reading, likely that they had, because Paul's sermon starts with the Jews in Egypt in bondage, which is a reading from the Torah, from the law. And Paul marches through into the prophets, and the prophetic reading may have had something to do with John the Baptist, because he goes from there to John the Baptist and says John the Baptist was the one who preached about Jesus. And then Jesus came, and Jesus is the redemption, and he's the answer to sin, and he is the, the hope of Israel and of the world. And, and the, the rulers in Jerusalem, they didn't recognize it. Which actually probably wasn't a, a bad thing to say, because I suspect in Pisidian Antioch, a lot of them thought the rulers in Jerusalem were a little too oversold on themselves in Jerusalem. You know, to say, hey, you would have had some people, I suspect, sitting back saying, yeah, it's typical Jerusalem. That's the way they are. I'm not surprised. They had the Messiah. They killed him. Uh huh. That's, that's the reason I don't go to Jerusalem very often. <laughs> and so. Paul explains that he not only was dead, Jesus was not only killed, buried, but resurrected on the third day to tons of eyewitness accounts if anybody wants to check into it. And Paul was never saying, you know, these, these guys didn't go around preaching messages of, you know, and he, and he appeared to three of us and then he left, but we saw him. Nah. Paul will tell the Corinthians, here are 500 people with names. You go talk to any of them. The resurrection of Jesus was no secret. It was very public. And so, so 
you know, the, J Paul says it. And the people are abuzz. Now, you'll notice if we look at that text one more time, Paul started out, and when Paul begins his most message, he says, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. Because the synagogue would not only have Jews, but it would have God-fearers, the Gentiles, who were also attending the synagogue because they were intrigued with this Jewish idea of one God. And we've talked about that in this class before, so I won't belabor the point, except to say these passages read so authentic to the time and to the values and to the content and to the people. It's amazing. The description of the Sabbath service that I gave you is not from somebody who's a scholar in Acts, who's just charting through this verse. It's from the top Jewish scholars who are charting through Jewish teaching of what was going on. It's just, that's what the Bible is. It's an authentic account of what happened. Now, I want to tell you more about this mission trip, if you'll come back next Sunday. But for right now, we're going to talk about some points for home. Points for home. First, there were in the church at Antioch prophets, and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. That's the way the NIV does it. A lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, a member of the household, and Saul. I just love this. I think, I don't know who Simeon who was called Niger, or Lucius, is the way you'd say it, hard seas, uh, Lucius of Cyrene. I don't know anything about them per se. And I'm sure there's a story, because Luke's using these names to people who knew it. He was writing for that day, as well as God using him to write for us. But look at that. Barnabas, the lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, all together in a church teaching. That would have been a hot church to go to. Oh man, that would have been so cool. You know, this is the same passage just a few verses earlier, and I didn't read it today, where Luke says, that's the first church, and those are the first people who were called Christians. That's where the label first came. What a happening church. My, 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 what God can do with those who serve him. And the coolest part is, you want to serve God? He can do phenomenally, incredibly awesome things through you. You don't want to? Okay. It's your choice. He's not going to make you. He'll get someone else to. You can play in the big game. Or you can go play in the garbage. Those are the real choices. Next. You know, it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. Now, for me, this is a real attitude check. Bodily ailments typically send me to bed whining. Becky has a full list of what a bodily ailment means for me. I need some mint tea. <sighs> What's wrong? I have a bodily ailment. My, how I respect people who, in the midst of bodily ailment, are able to do what's set out before them to do. There's nothing more important than the mission of God. And I need an attitude check. Because sometimes I'm not just distracted by bodily ailment, sometimes I'm just distracted by what I want. God forgive me. Last, Paul wrote this passage to the Ephesians, and when we start reading passages like this, where his, I, he had to feel like the plan was all coming together. All of a sudden, Paul, who'd been benched for nine years with what God had done for him and the upbringing he had and the Greek influence and the, the, the Paul, the rabbi, trained rabbi, all of a sudden, he's not just in the game. He's leading the charge. 
It's not Saul and, or Barnabas and Saul. It's Paul and Barnabas. And that's Paul's never, oh, look at me. It's not an elevating pride thing for Paul. It's an humbling thing because he knew how cruddy he was. And yet God was using him. So it's to God that Paul says to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask, than all we think, according to the power that he's at work within us. Uh, to him be the glory. And that's all Paul's about. And it is my prayer that that's all that I'll be about. That is exactly where God helped me learn to be. And I want you to be there with me. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Our Father, we thank you so much for the way Scripture is alive the way it's alive by your Holy Spirit as you quicken it in our hearts and minds, but also just the way it's alive that you've written such a vibrant history for us to be able to read and study and dig into, to transport us back 2,000 years ago, and to see the way your hand was moving in history to bring your kingdom on earth while we await the eternal rapture of your kingdom in heaven. We thank you for letting us be a part. Lord, find the people who are ignoring you. Find the people who are turning away from you. Find the people who are putting themselves first and shake them and reach into them and draw them to your light. Soften their hearts, clean out their ears so they can hear. Open their blinded eyes to see you and how compelling it is to follow you above anything else in the world. Through Jesus our Lord, amen.